Welcome to the first part of Lecture 2 on this course on Computational Fluid Dynamics. In this part of this lecture, we're going to examine the first stage of the CFD process, which is that of understanding your problem. Now, we're going to do this by means of four examples, each of which is meant to illustrate some key points. The thing to always remember is that you may not need computational methods to get the answer that you need to the precision that you want. Don't forget about the wealth of analytical methods and estimating methods that you as an engineer already know about for problem solving. If we do decide to use numerical methods, we're going to see that factors such as geometric factors play an important part in solving the problem. And we can use factors such as symmetry and periodicity to greatly simplify the problem that we're solving. We will also see that the nature of the fluid is critically important in determining what solver we use. We will use different solvers for Newtonian fluids, for viscoelastic fluids, and for viscoplastic fluids. And so an inadequate understanding of your fluid's rheology will lead to incorrect answers. So the first thing we'll do is to examine the step of problem definition in a little more formal detail. So here on my whiteboards, I'm going to put a few key points for you to remember. Now, problem definition is the most important step of the CFD process, because if you get this step wrong, everything else that follows is simply a waste of time. So, like any other tool, numerical modelling has to be used in the right way, with the right expectations, in order to solve the right problem. And you, as a modeller, need to have a crystal clear awareness of the following things. Firstly, the problem that's being solved. Secondly, the information that numerical modelling contributes to the solution of that problem. Thirdly, and very importantly, the appropriate level of detail that is fit for purpose for solving your problem. Both too little detail and too much detail will give you a big headache. Too little detail and the problem won't be solved accurately. Too much detail and it may just be too much information in order to see the solution. Or quite simply, the computer might be too inadequate to solve the problem. The fourth thing is how do you judge whether you've successfully solved a problem? How do you analyse that data and decide whether it is indeed fit for that purpose? The thing to always remember is that solving the wrong problem is going to waste time, it's going to waste resource, and in the real world it's going to waste money. And so thinking about your problem beforehand is of critical importance. Now, let's move on to the first of my four examples. Now, on the whiteboard in front of you, I've put a schematic diagram of a hot ball bearing. So, what we want to do is to cool this ball bearing down. Let's suppose this ball bearing is made of steel, and we're going to drop it through a cool oil bath, such that the core of the bearing becomes colder. OK? So, let's say that our criteria for the bearing being sufficiently cool enough is that the core temperature has fallen to 90% of the original temperature difference between the bearing and the ambient surroundings. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Let's also think that we might be able to do this as a coupled heat transfer and fluid flow problem within a multi-physics CFD package. OK, fine. So now what we'll do is we'll make some assumptions that we're going to use in the modelling process. We might assume, for example, that the oil bath, the cooling oil bath, is at a constant temperature. We might furthermore assume that that ball bearing falls through that oil bath at its terminal velocity. Now, we need to be careful, of course, because the terminal velocity for a single particle falling in a fluid is different than that to many particles falling in a fluid. And so, is this ball bearing on its own or as part of a particle swarm? Let's make another assumption. We're going to say that the heat transfer coefficient that determines the heat transfer between the ball bearing and the fluid is roughly constant all over the bearing surface. We may need to justify this assumption because the reality is it's probably not constant. But is making the assumption of constant heat transfer coefficient fit for purpose? Something to think about carefully. We're also going to assume that the material properties in all the materials, the oil and the steel in the ball bearing, are isotropic, that is, constant. OK, so the ramifications of these assumptions means that the temperature of the ball bearing only varies radially, so we can effectively solve the problem as a 1D problem, because temperature only varies as a function of radius. 
of angular position or azimuthal position, we have symmetry. It's fine because we have that constant heat transfer coefficient on the outside surface and we have a spherical geometry. So we're going to furthermore see that these assumptions lead to the condition, the boundary condition being a constant temperature at the surface of the bearing. Which means in terms of mathematics, we're solving the following heat transport equation. So on the left hand side, we have rho CP partial dt by dt. That's a variation of temperature with respect to time. On the right hand side, we can see that that will vary as a function of your heat transfer curve, the thermal conductivity K, and a function of radius. The initial and boundary conditions are stated thus, that temperature as a function of radius is constant initially, and that we have symmetry in the middle of the bearing, so there's no gradient at the middle, so dt by dr is zero at r equals zero. And at the outside edge at little r equals big R, we have whatever temperature the oil is, T infinity, for all times greater than zero. So that's the maths of the problem. OK, so we can solve this analytically. We don't need a computer. On the whiteboard in front of you, I've put a sketch of a Heisler chart. A Heisler chart is a graphical representation of the solution in spherical coordinates of that equation I've just put down. Or you could go and solve that equation directly using spherical harmonics. So, don't forget there are such things as exact analytical solutions. I'm sure you remember this. But why use computational methods to get an approximate answer when with a little thought you can use existing solutions to analytical equations to get an exact answer? So, in this example, we've got some key learning points to think about. The key learning points here is that the problem can be solved sufficiently with an analytical solution. The answer that you're aiming for, because it's an engineering use, you're cooling bearings down, you're probably going to factor in a safety factor anyway, 10% extra residence time. And so a high precision simulation actually is inappropriate. So, key learning point of all, don't fall into the trap of using CFD when an engineering calculation will suffice. Many people do, don't be one of them. OK, let's look at another example. Now, on the whiteboard in front of you, I've put a picture of a syringe, a medical syringe, where the outlet of that syringe is symmetrically in the centre of the syringe. Now, let's say within the syringe, we've got a fluid containing something called micelles. These are part of a microstructure. And these micelles are being expelled from this syringe. Now, the material in which these micelles are suspended is a functional material. And let's suppose that the functionality of this material depends on these micelles, this structure, not being damaged. And let's say we also know that damage occurs at known shear or extension rates. So there's a critical shear rate or a critical extension rate which will break up the micellular structure. And we don't want to do that. Now, let's say that engineering estimates have already been made, but the answer is unclear. Within the precision of the engineering estimate, let's say that the answer is, well, they might still be damaged, the precision's not great enough. We don't know, we need more accuracy. And so computational fluid dynamics, therefore, has been suggested to get a more accurate answer. OK, so we've justified not using an analytical approach now. Now, let's think. Before we start simulation, we need to know a few things. Um, we need to know about the rheology of the fluid. If we've got micelles, if we've got structure in a fluid, your instinct should be to say, this is probably not a Newtonian fluid. We need evidence of the rheology of the fluid, and then we need to choose our solver very carefully to match that rheology. We also need to think about thermal effects. If we look at this diagram of a syringe, we see that you've got a hypodermic needle, a very small diameter path, which will have very high shear rates. Don't forget about the phenomena of viscous dissipation. If your shear rates are high, and your viscosity is significant, there will be thermal energy dissipated as a result of the flow, which will increase the temperature of the fluid, which in turn will change the shear rates, which in turn will change the dissipation rate. And so you have a coupled dependency between your nature of your fluid flow, the shear and extension rates, and the temperature of the fluid. And usually viscosity and other material properties that describe the flow properties of fluids are temperature dependent.
So there are back of the envelope calculations you can do to determine whether or not viscous dissipation is likely to be an important factor. Now, let's suppose, for the sake of simplicity, that surprisingly our Newtonian has found our fluid has found to be Newtonian, and that viscous dissipation has found to be insignificant. So let's look at our geometry now. So on the whiteboard now I've put a sketch, a very crude sketch, of symmetry. We've got a syringe which has cylindrical symmetry, so we exploit it. We can also call cylindrical symmetry axisymmetry or axis symmetry. So the geometry is symmetric, but are the boundary conditions symmetric? Because we can only fully exploit symmetry if both are true. If we think about the boundary conditions, on the walls of the syringe, the interior walls, you have a no-slip boundary condition, and that's symmetric. You have an outlet at the base of the syringe, which happens to be on that symmetry line. And you have an imposed velocity by the plunger, again, that is symmetric about the axis. So our geometry is symmetric and our boundary conditions are symmetric. So axisymmetry is the right choice. And furthermore, we can choose a 2D simulation. This greatly simplifies the simulation. It greatly cuts down the number of equations that you're solving, which makes it faster and more tractable on, for example, a moderate laptop. So some key learning points here. Always consider what the simplest geometry is to solve the problem to the required accuracy it might well be possible to find axes of symmetry to convert a 3D problem into a 2D problem. But a word of caution, when you're doing this, don't overlook the fact that your boundary conditions may not be axisymmetric. You can only make this simplification if both geometry and boundary conditions obey the same symmetry. OK, let's go on to example three. So here on my whiteboard, again, I've put a syringe. But if you look carefully, you'll note that the outlet of the syringe is now off center, breaking axisymmetry. So this is now a fully three dimensional flow problem. So if we examine this, let's have a look and say that we recognize that we have an off center outlet to our syringe. We also recognize that my cells in this case do add viscoelasticity to our solution. So we have increasing complexity. Let's say we still want to know the fluid shear and extension rates and also the residence time of the fluid because we have a deformation sensitive material and we don't want to exceed these critical shear or extension rates. So we've made some critical changes. We need to ask ourselves some questions. Can the simulation tool you're using sufficiently capture the rheology of the fluid? Because the flow patterns are going to be critically dependent on the rheology. And this introduces another concept you need to think about, which is one of your mental model. Because we need to effectively know what to expect as an answer before we do the calculation. So have we got a sufficiently clear mental model ourselves of what would happen in such a geometry with a viscoelastic liquid? Now, we've broken symmetry, so we need to go fully 3D. 2D is no longer sufficient. However, if we look carefully at the 3D problem, we can still put a center line down the syringe. The exit of the syringe can be put in such a manner, if we look at it or rotate the syringe, such that we have a plane of symmetry rather than an axis of symmetry. So we can still make a geometric simplification, which will cut down the amount of calculation time required. Now, key point here about mental models. Flow simulation for viscoelastic liquids, or flows in viscoelastic liquids generally, have structures that you may not expect and that will be different from their Newtonian counterparts. I'm going to put a series of pictures up on your whiteboard now, which show streamlines of flow for increasing volumetric flow rates. So at low volumetric flow rate, you have streamlines that roughly resemble a Newtonian flow. However, as we increase and increase and increase our volumetric flow rate, if you look very closely in the contracting part of the syringe, near the exit, you can see that there is a vortex forming. And the so-called upstream vortices, upstream of contraction typically, are very common in viscoelastic liquids. And so if your mental model doesn't incorporate that before you start to do CFD, then when you see a solution such as this plotted out, you will ask yourself, well, what's going on? Is this right? Do I understand this? 
Do I trust what the computer's doing? If a priori you know to expect these upstream vortices, then you might be surprised if you don't find it. So, some key learning points here for you. A good engineer will typically know the answer, or at least expect roughly what the answer is before they work it out. So, what is your mental model like? If you don't have a rough mental model of the likely solution before you start it, do enough background research to make sure that you do. You need to be able to sanity check what the computer's doing. You don't want what the computer calculates to come as a surprise to you, because what the computer calculates might be wrong, and you might need to go, ah, that's wrong and actually recognise it from your mental model. So do your background research before you start. Don't forget, if you've got a 3D problem, you can still incorporate planes of symmetry to simplify it. And the other really important thing, it's really important to match the solver's capability to the material properties within your simulation. In this case, if we're using a Newtonian solver to try and work out what the flow pattern in a viscoelastic liquid is, we would have got the completely wrong answer. So. Be careful. Match capability to problem. OK, let's have a little look at a final example. A little bit simpler now. Suppose what we have is a Newtonian fluid flowing through a periodically constricted glass tube. And the diagram on your whiteboard is a slice through that glass tube. And you can see you've got large diameter chambers and small diameter interconnects. And that pattern repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats. OK, so... If we've got a large number of constrictions here, you're going to end up with a very, very complex geometry to model. Yes, we can use axisymmetry, but it's very long, and you've got these repeated cells where mixing's going to happen effectively. Um, and we may want to simplify this because we might not have a computer with enough memory to solve this problem. Now, as we get the fluid a certain way along this periodically constricted structure, there is going to be the same pattern in each of these periodic constrictions. And so a trick you can play is just model a unit cell of such a tube. So it assumes that you're looking at the steady state part of the flow, so it'll be one or two or three or four constrictions away from the flow entrance. But what we can do is, shown here on the whiteboard, you have that dotted box around one of your cells, and what you have is something called periodic boundary conditions. What happens in a periodic boundary is the flow outlet from that dotted box is mapped onto the flow inlet. It's iterated through and the flow outlet is then remapped onto the flow inlet and so on and so forth until the flow outlet and the flow inlet are effectively the same within whichever tolerance you've chosen. And so periodic boundaries can greatly simplify long geometries that have a repeating pattern. So, let's look overall at some key points from this part of this lecture. The first and most important thing to do is to make sure you understand the problem that you are trying to solve. Make sure you understand the precision within which you need to know the answer. If quick engineering estimates are sufficient, use them. Don't waste your time and money on long-winded computation. Know your material properties, especially the rheology of your fluid, and match the capability of a solver to the material properties that you're simulating. If symmetry is present, exploit it. If periodicity is present, exploit it. And hopefully by going through this process, you'll sufficiently understand your problem to make all the rest of the steps in the CFD process relatively straightforward.